Uh, on the other hand, the word is full of the ruins of civilizations that died because they sacrificed the value of sustainability to the pressures and greed of the present. They overgrazed, overfarmed, and generally overexploited their surroundings and their people. These past social ecological collapses were always local. Wilderness was available to start the cycle over again. What is unique to our situation is that not only must we sustain ourselves, we must be careful to do so in ways that also sustain the planet's major life systems. We humans have grown in number and power to the point where we control the destiny not only of our own species, but the millions of others with whom we share this relatively tiny globe. This recognition that the unsustainability of present day societies and institutions is a global crisis and it is central to the sustainability movement. This is a diagram here which basically explains sustainability in three spheres, environmental, social, economic. They come together, things happen. Collapse. In terms of sustainability, collapse is the point at which growth and associated demands on the environment from social and economic pressures is sufficient to exhaust the supply. It is the point at which our highly dependent society is no longer apt to continue supporting the quality of life to which we are each accustomed. We work abstractly, earning money to pay others who are also working to earn money to pay others to provide the things we need. The size of our societies and our global community has been sufficient to cause many to think that collapse has been imminent for some time. While there are those that make predictions, prepare individually for shortage, there are those that are working on all levels to decrease our impact and catalyze a common shift to a more sustainable way of life. This is a political comic of how growth can cause collapse when sustainability cannot keep up with growth, which is the situation that we're in now. The sustainability movement. What is the sustainability movement? What are its roots and where is it going? Like most genuine social movements, it, de it defies easy definition. The borders are fuzzy and the participants all too diverse and changing to be pinned down by a set of words. This movement compounds these problems by the unusually broad scope of topics it addresses, as well as its deep resistance to being limited by labels and boundaries. Nevertheless, the movement exists, and the work of people within it offers the world some of the best reasons to hope for a positive future. Please consider the following points and overview of the essence of the movement and where it is headed. In speaking about this, I want to emphasize that while I consider to myself and my wife to be a part of this movement, I or we do not claim to speak for it. Old systems thinking. The second key concept of the sustainability movement is that of whole systems thinking, an approach that surprisingly seems to be more, profound, more profoundly define the movement than even the concern for sustainability. What distinguishes whole systems thinking is a keen awareness of the importance of interconnections, relationships, consequences, and feedback loops. It involves a willingness to consider all significant aspects of an issue and not to jump to appealing but usually wrong simplifications. The movement's concern with sustainability comes as a result of taking a whole systems approach seriously. This approach also leads naturally to the other characteristics of the movement that follow. A humane and biocentric focus. People in the sustainability movement both value both the human and non-human equally. They resist the temptation to pit humans against nature and are often just as interested in issues of economic fairness and human rights as in environmental well-being. Indeed, they will usually insist that separations between these various categories are artificial and misleading. Learning and innovation. Closely associated with the movement's whole systems perspective is the high value it places on learning and innovation as a response to problems rather than a critique and complaint. The movement certainly has many who are skillful at criticism, but criticism is used as a tool, not an end. For the movement is basically vision-oriented. It is motivated by a desire to build a better world, not just tear down the one we have. The movement is not populated by Pollyannas. It faces our culture's problems squarely with a hard-nosed realism, but it is decidedly optimistic about our capacity to learn and to grow. Sorry, back to this. 
This optimistic basis is especially reflected in the movement's make it better attitude towards science and technology. There is much in present day science and technology that the movement strongly criticizes, but it is nevertheless at home with the spirit of empirically tested exploration that characterizes science at its best. Interestingly enough, a significant number of those who have been most visibly active in the movement came out of conventional scientific careers. Wes Jackson, Diana Meadows, Brian Swim, Armory Lovins, David Splanger, Todd Jod Tud, John Todd, and uh, Dan and Parry, to name just a few. Leadership and partnership. It also seems characteristic of people in this movement to adopt the role of servant leaders, acting in the background, doing what needs to, to be done, and not directly calling attention to themselves. Like enzymes, often working to break down artificial barriers and create partnerships, and like catalysts, seeking leverage points or bottlenecks where little effort can be set, little effort can set processes in motion that have beneficial system-wide effects. Citizen diplomacy is a good example of both strategies. As Hazel Henderson put it, there are distinguishing new cultural, they are designing new cultural DNA and trying to splice it directly into society's genes. <coughs> Spirituality. There is a tremendous diversity of spiritual orientation within the movement, from active members of various traditional religions to free thinkers of all types. Nevertheless, it is accurate to say that most people in the movement are comfortable with the idea of spirituality, with the idea that there may be more things than heaven and earth than is included in the standard materialist description of the universe. There is, however, no sense of antagonism between spirituality and science. Indeed, if there is a spiritual bias in the movement, it is towards creation-centered spirituality, including the sense that we are learning about the world, that what we are learning about the world through the sciences has positive spiritual significances, and what the sustainable movement is not. A note of distinction. The sustainability movement sometimes gets misidentified with two other much better known social movements, the environmental movement and the new age movement. This confusion is partially understandable since many of the movements and concepts that we would identify with the sustainability movement are also claimed by one or both of these other movements. However, there are important ways in which the sustainability movement is different and distinct. It insists on a whole systems approach, whereas the environmental movement has focused on the human impact upon non-human systems, and the New Age movement has focused on spirituality and personal growth. Unlike much of the environmental movement, it is vision and solution oriented. Unlike the New Age movement, it is primarily concerned with the nuts and bolts of ecological and cultural health. People working in the sustainability movement are generally happy to work with these and other social movements, but in doing so retain their commitment to a practical, positive, whole systems approach. And on the horizon for now and tomorrow, during the 1980s, most of the people in the sustainability movement worked quietly on the outside, putting their energy into such things as developing alternatives in education, agriculture, businesses, organization, and energy use. Building citizen diplomacy with the Soviet Union, tracking the deterioration in the natural environment, and drawing up plans for redesigned communities, cities, and entire economies. Today, sustainable perspectives and innovations are becoming mainstream at a dizzying pace. There is still remains much that is inadequate about the, the way institutions are approaching the concept of sustainability, but there is no denying that their level of public credibility for people within the movement and for their ideas is at an all-time high. There is today a greater emphasis on putting the movement's innovations into broad practice. Sustainable is now a buzzword that anchors our, our conscious way beyond, that anchors in our conscious way beyond sustainably harvest Christmas trees. Even both the city of Miami and Dade County have offices of sustainable initiatives. An ability to communicate with a much larger audience. The increased awareness of environmental and social problems from rainforest destruction to drug use has dramatically raised interest in the kinds of innovative solutions the movement has to offer but the movement is still not adequately telling such stories. Increased attention to redesigning human institutions, especially in economics and governance. The bottleneck to developing a humane and sustainable world is clearly no longer technological or ecological, though ecological imbalances may cause great trouble in the years ahead. 
But while we know a great deal about what could be done in such areas of energy efficiency and environmental restoration, we know a lot less about the design of humane and sustainable human institutions. Institutions that could both implement the needed solutions quickly and effectively and provide an ongoing vehicle for fulfilling an environmentally sane quality of life and a broad sense of participation. All of this increased visibility and ever-increasing sense of urgency in the society has helped to change the movement from a relatively small and unnoticed group of researchers and innovators to a broad movement affecting all aspects of society. I feel that it is important that we be prepared to step into this role, to live by example, and to provide assistance and leadership to others who want to put their energies into promoting the planet's real agenda. Okay. Now we're moving on to the Transit Antenna Project, which, if you are not aware, is a project that my wife and I are currently spearheading. Um, we live in a bus and uh, we travel the country or have traveled the country for a number of years now, um, visiting people who are interested in off-grid living, um, producing art as we go along, and engaging the communities that we enter into on the subjects of sustainability through the arts. The Transit Antenna project began in 2005 as a mobile living experiment. Eight individuals, three couples, one kid, and a dog. That's them, or at least their pictures that they chose to represent themselves. They embarked on an exhaustive tour of the US in a retrofitted vegetable-powered RTS transit bus which combined with the well-known phrase, the artist is the antenna of society, or the race, depending on whether you read Kandinsky or Pound, inspired the name Transit Antenna. For the first few years, crewed by an eclectic mix of videographers, photographers, printmakers, musicians, muralists, textile designers, and one pastry chef, not to mention various hitchhikers, Transit Antenna's mission was more a satisfaction of individual interests that arranged themselves democratically to determine mutually satisfactory activities and routes. They traveled extensively, beginning in South Carolina and traversing the country, roamed as far as the Denali National Park in Alaska. They documented their journeys through this, the dedicated project website, transitantenna.com, painted murals, made videos, wrote articles for local papers, volunteered on farms and with community-led projects, and provided demonstrations and talks. Uh, how we became involved. Um, in 2008, my wife sent me a link to the Transit Antenna Project website. She had begun looking for artists for a project space here in the Design District and thought I might be interested in their story for the Miami-based art blog Art Lurker, which I had just started. At the time, we were expecting our second child and moving out of a dilapidated second-floor duplex on Biscayne Boulevard into a beautiful house in El Portal, the secluded bird sanctuary part near uh, Biscayne and the Tequesta Habitation Mound. So I forgot about the link for over a year, and after finding it buried in my bookmarks, I contacted them, and over the course of the interview, which I eventually published in July of 2009, I became enamored with whatever idea I had of nomadic life back then. Later that year, as they were in California, I was hatching a plan to visit them on a combined trip to visit another artist, John Bucklin, who some of you may know, on one of his gold panning elopes. The trip, incidentally, never transpired, as with my desire to build a career as a serious or perhaps at least conventional arts journalist. However, in preparation for it, I was, on the advice of Transit Antenna founder Bob Sneed, actively looking to purchase an old bus of some kind. I was, I guess it would be fair to say, in the heyday of my excitement and naivety about the project when Bob called me to say that their bus had died and was to be buried at East Jesus, an experimental this is a quote, an experimental, habitable, extensible artwork in progress, which is essentially a community-run art park consisting of crapped-out vehicles in Slab City, which itself is a decommissioned, uncontrolled World War II marine barracks come snowbird campsite in the Colorado desert in southwestern California, with a year-round population of off-grid enthusiasts, hermits, tinkers, and artists. Some of these residents, or slabbers as they call themselves, derive their living by way of government checks, supplementary security income, social security, and social security disability, and have been driven to the slabs through poverty. Bob then, in his infinite wisdom, proposed, his bus still warm on the slabs, that I proceed with the purchase of a bus and take over the project. 
I, of course, accepted. The story of the bus's retrieval. <clears throat> so I found a bus that I thought was in Pensacola, and I made a down payment sight unseen. In preparing for my trip to retrieve it, I realized it was, in fact, in northwest Arkansas. So, on July 18th, leaving my wife, four-year-old son, and daughter, who in my absence began crawling, I took a plane with Bob via Dallas to Fayetteville, Arkansas. From there, we taxied to the home of one Bill Watson, the seller of the bus, a wheelchair-bound Vietnam vet. Bill's son, an unemployed plumber slash hunter with a criminal record for non-payment of child support who lived in a weapon-festooned bunker under the main house he called the kill zone, <clears throat> had been working on the engine in preparation for my purchasing the bus. But when we arrived, as you can see, it was a long way off. Bill's wife put us up in a small trailer on the property and for almost three very cold weeks we worked on the bus's engines, air and electrical systems and sold the seats on Craigslist to some guy from Texas for 500 bucks. During this process I settled up with Bill, but after finally getting to the point where we could test drive the bus, finding it couldn't get out of second gear and realizing that Bill had already spent my money at an out of state casino, we resigned one dark night <laughs> on the tail end of an ice storm that would have grounded us for another week or more, and as Bill was attending to a sudden death of a family member who had received dishonorable discharge from the military, Bob and I set off for Kansas at 20 miles an hour to a mechanic who offered to help us try to figure out the problem. Neither the expectancy of the mechanic's ability to help us nor the driving conditions at this point were anywhere close to ideal, but we were desperate. So, after 10 hours of driving in 15 degree temperatures, manually actuating our hazard lights as the flasher had burned out, we arrived in Kansas and were thankfully saved. Our place of salvation was Rantoul, Kansas, and these guys. And the business of one Sam Kaler, who you see to the left, our left, who among other things firstly showed us how to turn the heat on in our bus, and then pulled three other transmissions from other buses, switched out our tires, adjusted our throttle, and sent us away by around 5.30 p.m., charging only $700 in labor. Rantoul, Kansas, for anyone who's not been there, is kind of a big things graveyard with fields upon fields filled with planes, parts of planes, buses, trains, even rockets, but simply alive with country hospitality and goodwill. We drove back to Miami in one shot, and after turning green and passing out on the floor of my lounge, moved the bus to the then residence of Miami-based artist Richard Hayden, who is somewhere here tonight. Oh, there he is. My wife and I then began systematically quitting jobs, selling up, and on our last night in our house, burning letters, documents, and photographs. We moved onto the bus as soon as the beds were finished. This is a couple of images of what the bus did look like and what it looked like now. So this is the, we ripped out the floor, we ripped out the walls, we put in two bulkheads, we extended the original bathroom from like a, a three by one to a three by three. My wife and I have a queen, the children both have bunk beds. Um, it's pretty spare, but we, we spent a lot of time designing it to get it how we wanted to because we, we thought we would be traveling for a while. We didn't expect we'd be doing it this long, but it has become a home and we, we just keep, keep adding to it. I figure we'll grow out of it in a few years. We moved onto the beds as soon as the, as we moved onto the bus as soon as the beds were finished, kitchenless and effectively camping. Every night we designed more of our home, each day we built what we could with what we could find. In fact, the majority of the walls and floor in the bus came from an exhibition called An Uneven Floor, which was an, un an undulating plywood construction kindly donated to us on the proviso that I indeed installed the installation by Locust Projects from their former space just over there on 38th Street. Owing to the prolific activity of the previous crew and my accent, I was able to provide for many of our material needs especially those for the bus's fuel system through sponsorship, and received many other in-kind donations, including a yacht helmsman's chair as a driver's seat, a water pump, relays, solar panels, charge controllers, tires, inverter charges, and even clothing. This is a shot of uh, our bed and our daughter's bedroom, and this is the bunk above our bed, which is Mateo's our seven-year-old's bedroom. <clears throat> the website is replete with um, designing images and photographs of our journeys and 
more shots of inside the bus if anyone's interested. With the help of Dacra Realty and Miami's arts community, whom we engaged and implored to assist us in producing a Coney Island-style carnival funfair, what, which, was in, which was then the design district's palm lot, uh, we raised a nice chunk of money and set off. Initially, we broke down <clears throat> a lot, and I was somewhat of a baby when it came <clears throat> to what appeared to be insurmountable or unresolvable mechanical problems. Within the first half hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to the point that I actually insisted after a major oil leak that we stop right where we were and begin working for a roadside citrus market. But it and I got better, occasionally worse, often appalling or even catastrophic. And then the focus shifted away from art, for me especially, um, primarily because we broke down on 40 acres of swamp infested woodland in upstate New York and with no money and no means to repair the bus uh, literally had to survive um, for four months on dumpstered food and whatever we could find on the property which although unconventional was in fact bountiful and ranged from a variety of wild mushrooms to snakes edible flowers and uh, and even using cattail pollen as a flower substitute this is Matteo and I preparing garter snakes and this is the children after one of our mushroom foraging trips. One could argue that we were so beset by the daily grind of what was essentially a settler's existence except for the most part we were flinging ourselves down the road literally as fast as we could go which on a good day was around 60 miles per hour drained by a subsistence diet and so exhausted both physically and emotionally by mechanical problems that we had to no time for thinking, let alone art making. But the truth is far the truth is that far from a chore, these chores became the the interest themselves. And as we struggled on, seemingly unaffected by the economy which had begun to crumble around us, we began to realise whether it is true for any of you or not that that we felt way more secure in our rent and bill-free self-built mobile home, relying on our wits to secure water and forage for both money and food as needed, and homeschool our children, than we ever would have living in our house that we did not own, relying on professionals to service it, a monthly paycheck that will probably not always be there to pay for it, and an institution to educate and acculturate our children while we worked for it. This initial shift in perspective led into a fascination for the systems we were using to survive. Those that we were designing and installing ourselves, such as fuel systems, that's our vegetable oil uh, processing and conditioning system. Uh, if anyone has any interest, I could just point out very briefly how it worked. Um, here we have a, a large uh, gear pump that pushes 75 litres of uh, oil raw oil uh, minute. Um, this pipe here connects here and the oil is then sucked up through this pipe uh, into this tank. There's a heated pickup on the top of this tank and this pump here, which is the water pump, pumps the oil through the heated pickup through an initial filter which is this one into this tank, into the heated tank. The oil circulates in this tank is then pumped out of this tank into a centrifugal filter, which spins the oil, causing it to vaporize, um, holding the water in the centrifuge and allowing the clean oil to pass out and back into the tank. We would normally do a cyclical system thing of that for about six hours, and then pass it through this one micron filter into our main tank just to be safe. It's never been perfect. We're constantly having to basically give our bus a dialysis because we get all kinds of water and crap and algae growing in the tank and anyone that's dealt with vegetable oil in its pure form as a fuel will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, where are we? <clears throat> oh, and this is our solar voltaic system. We have four panels on the roof donated to us from a, a scientist in North Carolina. The... Uh, the charge controller, which is the black box there on the white box, is, is also from the same scientist. The white box is an inverted charger that changes raw DC power um, to AC power for appliances. 
and the batteries are um, forklift batteries. They look similar to golf cart batteries, but they're each six volts, which wired in series parallel gives us a 20 volt, 24 volt system. And where was I? Okay, so this initial shift in perspective led into a fascination for the systems we were using to survive. Oh, no, I totally read that. Did you change these sheets on me while I was talking? Maybe the kids did it. Maybe they did. Okay, uh, fuel systems, solar systems, plumbing, water filtration systems. Um, to those permanent systems, some of which we use, most of which we ignore, uh, such as nutritional cycles, growing and harvest seasons, food cultures, enzymes, etc. We started composting not just vegetables and eggshells, but all organic waste, meat, bones, oils, excrement, and trying to recycle every piece of packaging that we could not avoid buying, with the exception of styrofoam and thin plastics. Anything we could not reuse, we recycled commercially. We began to shop smarter, preferring to support local and or independent and or sustainably operated businesses, farms and or products over supermarkets, which led us to eat more seasonably and fresher. We began to repair and reuse materials, clothes, often opting to go without or make what we needed, including many of the toys and things we gave our children at birthdays and Christmas. We are still improving these systems, developing habits and mutually beneficial relationships and living an ever higher quality of life for ever less cost. It is not always pleasant or easy, but that's just a part of anyone's life. And when I say high quality of life, you're having problems with the iPad. I'm not gonna fix it. <clears throat> and when I say high quality of life, I mean clean water, beautiful surroundings, abundant food, play, a sense of no time, leisurely pursuits of education or activity and a deepening appreciation for life as a function of relationship. The present transit antenna in context. I'll just see if I have an image for that. I don't think I do. Nope. The notion of living a nomadic lifestyle in mobile collectives and following the seasons is ancient. Older and more ingrained in us, I believe, than even humanity, civilization or arguably culture. From the lifestyle of pre-written language human ancestors to Native American tribes people to people like my wife and myself, people all through history have periodically changed location to maximize the advantages of climate and environment. And while hippie or gypsy, unfortunately neither in the vernacular, are often terms used to describe the transit antenna project and travelers or traveling families in general, we feel more like the nomadic house truckers of New Zealand who practice alternative lifestyles and promote sustainable energy. House truckers are individuals, families and groups who convert old trucks and school buses into mobile homes and live in them. Here is one taking root. Preferring an unattached and transient lifestyle to more conventional housing. These nomads are found traveling independently and in convoys from town to town, making a living from small cottage industries such as arts and crafts, or following various fruit picking seasons as they occur throughout their nation. In the past we have been accused of being a burden to society, expecting others to support us in our ventures as we mooch off of friends and family. But while we have accepted help where appropriate, and although the name of our project is not Working Odd Jobs Across America, <coughs> the members of Transit Antenna have always, myself, my wife and previous crew included, taken on a variety of vocations to sustain themselves financially, from stripping a hundred-year-old porch in Clover, South Carolina, to working as butchers for Indian Valley Meats, a family-owned custom processor of fish and exotic meats, including reindeer, venison, buffalo, and all of Alaska's wild game animals. We have learned a lot about boundaries, about people, and having a perspective of home that is unconventional about how people and boundaries come together, both in terms of public and private domains. Once framed by an artistic context, the Transit Antenna Project, ironically under the direction of two individuals with exclusively <coughs> artistic backgrounds, has evolved organically, as it apparently intends to do, into a demonstration of alternative living, a kind of mobile creative workshop, 
and a resource, one of many, for anyone wanting to live with a decreased dependence on infrastructure. It's not didactic, though at times our blog post instructionals are. It's more an example, an experiential living report, and far from being proof or a proof of sustainability, it is what we are doing now. It's up to you whether you see that as an artistic, cultural, or even important statement. Transit antenna in Miami. So what have we done in Miami? Aside from the aforementioned fundraiser, Transit Antenna has hosted workshops on biofuel and renewable energy, met with county and city commissioners and officers in regard to zoning, land use and sustainable practices, campaigned and provided financial and volunteer assistance to campaigns, worked with and on the behalf of non-profit organizations, supported community-based agriculture, managed farmers markets, and most recently after returning to Miami in September of last year, realized the demonstration of urban sustainability in Wynwood, which opened for Basel, called the Midtown 34th Street Project. And in addition to working on projects that have yet to be announced, we have set up gardens, water catchment systems, and grey water filtering systems on request, and wherever we have been parked. This is a picture of one of the gardens that we helped to design and irrigate in Wynwood. And this is a grey watering filtration system that we put in most recently. The first, the, going from the pole, uh, there's an initial uh, pool of charcoal, which acts as a natural filter that leads through into a sort of a bog bed of um, newly planted papyrus and water lettuce and any other kind of animals that I could find in rivers. And up the front here we have new grass that's been planted in addition to some succulents. And I guess we'll check back and see how it's doing. Sustainability in Miami. I'm going to talk briefly here about just a couple of the organizations that I've come into contact with. Maybe other people know more that we can talk about and consider this more of an informa uh, information mining session than, than an actual lecture. Um, there are a few organizations that I can talk a little about that are happening now in Miami that evoke this, the three spheres, which we saw earlier, uh, which I'll go back to. Uh, in a sense, uh, what might be happening in terms of sustainable practices, uh, I'll start that sentence again. There are a few organizations I can talk a little about that are happening now in Miami that evoke the three spheres beyond, in a sense, what, you might, what might be happening in terms of sustainable practices, such as organic or sustainably grown foods, as, manif as manifest in the explosion of farmers markets and gourmet food trucks that are what you might consider singular in their approach to sustainability. The organizations are the Art of Cultural Evolution. The Art of Cultural Evolution is a non-profit organization dedicated to advancing sustainable solutions through the arts. This organization now exclusively run the Midtown 34th Street Project, which is still a live demonstration of urban sustainable living. They have a regular program of events ranging from free classes and workshops to community gardening parties, events for children, and seed swaps. The administrators are increasingly involved with an ever-broadening network of affiliates from local businesses to arts organizations. In fact, I believe they are soon to be a pickup point for Cannonball's CSA, which is the Community Supported Art Initiative of the formerly known as um, uh, Legal Art. <clears throat> uh, the next is uh, IOB, or IOB.org. Uh, though originally a New York organization, IOB.org has minions in Miami that are poised to make big moves in terms of awareness. Standing for In Our Backyards, they are kind of like Kickstarters for Miami, or sorry, just like kind of like Kickstarter for sustainable community projects. But unlike Kickstarter, if you don't reach your goal, they work with you, refine your budget, and help make things happen. As we can see, there are no projects at the moment coming out of Miami. The closest being a playground in Tampa Heights, uh, but hopefully this will change soon. Um, another organization which I know little about, as it's never really opened, um, is Barrio Workshop. I don't know if anyone's heard of Barrio. Um, currently housed on West Flagler, though they are in the process of changing spaces and names, 
uh, Barrio, which we will refer to them now, are Miami's first dedicated maker space, designed to encourage a breed of hobbyist entrepreneur through membership model that gives access to a strong community incubator for new businesses founded in sustainable practices. Based on a tech shop, uh, based on the tech shop in, Calif in California, Barrio, or whatever it will be called when it opens, will almost <laughs> will also be working towards rentable co-working workshop space, much like the um, third ward in uh, in the Bronx. And uh, finally, a, a, a word on Emerge Miami. Uh, whose mission is to strengthen social bonds between progressive individuals with organizations and independent businesses in South Florida in order to more effectively accomplish individual goals. That's a quote from their About page. Among other noteworthy events, Emerge Miami organize activist-style walks and bike rides, in some cases regular routes and annual events, uh, that facilitate awareness about the city, its resources, and public and individual health. Uh, they station themselves in temporary installations, petition for public safety, and disseminate information pertaining to increased social consciousness in an upbeat, progressive fashion to whomever will listen. Uh, they meet every Tuesday at Sweat Records, so maybe next week uh, you, can, uh, you can do it. <clears throat> I feel um, that the time for the sustainability movement in Miami to overcome its, its Hamlet-like reluctances has been and will always be. Uh, my contention is that it is all in our best of our interests to reassess how we each live, how we do business, eat, move around, etc., and make concerted efforts to conscientiously and continuously audit our lives with a view to reducing our current impact on our shared and only environment. Uh, we must, finally, we must each also be willing to stand up for a humane and sustainable world petition policymakers and work for the adoption of innovative solutions and spread the spirit of optimism and partnership through altruistic deeds and for want of a more compelling word, a loving approach to all things. But it is not easy, as we have found, moving from place to place as code enforcement insists. Striving to live simply and conscientiously seems, it seems is not is what ex is expected of us by the majority of cities that we have visited or even their inhabitants. And I believe it has much to do with what we represent in terms of economy. In medieval society in the West comparable to Hindu society um, allowed people to basically check out of the game. Uh, it revered and encouraged hermits and monks and nuns of various types of disciplines. And the difference between the West and India is that you couldn't join for example, the Brahma caste, which is the priest caste, from some other caste. But in the European caste system, by becoming a priest or a cleric of any kind, um, a cleric meaning just a literary person, you could familiarize with any other caste. And so it was a wonderful way of rising in society. You could, from being a serf, go to being a priest, to being an archbishop, and consort with the nobility. It was the only way to cross castes and because they were literary people, it was through literacy and through universities founded by clerics that our caste system began to break apart. And we got the idea of choosing our own vacation, vocation and not simply following what our parents did. Now, I want to make a final observation here about checking out of the game. As many have suggested that we have. I mean, we live apart from society, but we rely upon society very much. But we've found that we've been pushed to the fringes of every city that we've been to because people don't want travelers to come. They see us even with an, an, a relatively nice looking bus or an organization as the gateway to opening the doors for a bunch of um, gypsies to basically inhabit the town. And and this is something that we have we have come up against in terms of people's perceptions about people who choose to live nomadically. Um, so about checking out of the game, as many have suggested we have, uh, but which for us was the beginning of a search for a new way of being, of living and of thinking. This is not encouraged in contemporary society. 
because the Catholic Church and even say the the Christian Church are very powerful minorities, they can still support monasteries and hermits. But you cannot be one on your own, it seems, without great difficulty. Firstly, because you are a poor consumer. Everywhere we have traveled, we have found people living alternative lifestyles in relative isolation, yet surrounded by the rest of the country and its values. They are not necessarily working class people. More often, they are people who have dropped out of college because they thought it was stupid. You might call them beatniks. But the city doesn't like that because they aren't owning the right sort of cars, and so the local car salesman can't do business with them. They don't own property or lawns, so they have no need to place or store lawn nodes, contraptions of home improvement. Nor can that make use nor can they make use of related landscaping or pest control services. They hardly use dishwashers or appliances of any kind. They don't need them. And also they wear blue jeans or donated clothes and so the local dress shops feel a bit put out by having these people around. And they live simply, as we attempt to do. But the sense we got is that people are saying that you mustn't do that. You, you've got to live in a complicated way. You've got to have the kind of card that identifies you as a person of substance and status and all of that. And there is this great problem in our society. And, and why is there this problem? That there is always an inconsiderable minority of these non-joiners or people who object to and or check out of the game. But you will find that insecure societies are the most intolerant of those who are non-joiners. As they are so unsure of the validity of their game rules that they say that everyone must play. And that's kind of a double bind. You can't say to a person, you must play, because what you're really saying is that you're required to do something that is acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. So everyone in the United States must play, and it's the rule in almost all Republican governments. And I mean Republican as in democratic as opposed to monarchical. Ironically, America as a republic is a republic run by a democratic that upholds a majority monarchical religious and world view. But more about that later, I suppose. And governments like these are very uneasy because everybody is responsible. I mean, you might try not to be and avoid it and say, oh, let the senators take care of it and let the politicians. But theoretically, everybody is responsible. And that's kind of terrifying. You see, because it's all right when you know what's right, when there is an aristocrat, there is an aristocratics or a clergy, you know, because they're used to ruling things, so they'll know what to do. But now it's kind of in our hands. So you say what we are going to do, because I, I think this way, and he thinks another, and she thinks another way, so we're all sort of unsettled. And therefore we become more and more conformist. Individualism, Rugged individualism always leads to conformism because people get scared and so they herd together and that compounded by industrial society, mass production, etc. They all wear the same brands of clothes and we kind of get duller and drabber and dumber. The reason for this is in a way that democracy as we have tried it started out on the wrong foot I believe. Uh, not to harp on about religion too much, but in the Christian scriptures it says everyone is equal in the sight of God. Now that in itself is a mystical utterance, and that means that people are divine and are playing their true function, and that is, that is something that is true on a certain plane of consciousness. But if we come down a notch and try to apply the mystical insight in the practical affairs of everyday life, what do we get? We get a parody of mysticism. You get the idea that not everybody is equal in the sight of God, but that all people are equally inferior. And that's why bureaucracies are rude, why the police are rude, why you're made to wait in lines, because everybody's a crook. Equally inferior, and that type of society, watch out for it, because it turns in a quick click into fascism, because of its terror of the outsider. Now, a free and easy society loves outsiders, in fact, it's a little bad for the outsider's integrity because he or she almost becomes a holy man and people make offerings and take care of the outsider because they know that a man is doing for us what they haven't got the guts to do themselves because that man out there, up there or whatever on the mountaintop is at the highest peak of human evolution. I'm not talking about myself, examples. 
because his consciousness is one with the divine and and it's just great that there's someone like that around because he's realized what it's all about and so we need a number of those people even though they don't join our game they they tell us you know what you're doing is only a game we're not going to condemn you but it's only a game and <laughs> We on that mountaintop, we're watching you and we accept you and we have compassion for you, but excuse us please, we're not going to join in. So that gives the community great strength because it tells the community in no uncertain terms that there is something more than government. And it tells the government in no uncertain terms that there's something more than government. That's why wise kings kept not only priests but court fools around. The latter being much more effective than the priest to remind the king that after all he is just human. It's like how in Richard II, um, where the fool is, is called the antic, the king says, within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temple of a king sits death his watch. And there the antic sits, scoffing at this state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a little time to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. And at last comes death, and with a pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell king. But it is very difficult for a republican government to realize that and to do that because it is very insecure. And therefore, in our present world, you cannot abandon nationality or allegiance with a culture without the greatest difficulty. And people who do this get deported or, like us, constantly move from one place to another. You must belong to this thing. As Thoreau put it, however far into the forests you may go, men will pursue you and compel you to belong to their desperate company of odd fellows. And, and I close this, this talk um, with, with news that as of yesterday we were forced to, to leave Miami. Beyond our, we basically exhausted the circle of resources that we had for parking spots and have, have traveled down to the Redlands and are now parked there. Um, we drove onto a property two and a half acres, covered in about 12 foot high grasses. And we drove into those grasses and pulled them up around our bus and, and we are hiding there. And, and that's a real shame. Because when we first came to Miami, our, our instinct was to, to engage the community and to try to provide something, a perspective or, or an effort that, that would help. And we'd spent a certain amount of time going from one place to another, hiding from police and from whomever that didn't want us parking on city or public property. And we thought that coming back to our cradle, things would be different. And for a short period of time, they were with the Midtown 34th Street project. And we were actively speaking with the city. And, but it, it seems that it's incredibly hard here to do that. And, and now we find ourselves hiding again out in the Redlands. We're cooking up other projects and you know we're always writing and working and we have things down the line but but I wanted to close with that sort of slightly negative um, outlook on on where we are right now just to give an idea of of not what sustainability is up against in Miami but what nomadism is up against in Miami. And there are people here in Miami that are that are trying to campaign through data analysis, they've, they've discovered on-ramps which are not uh, often used and they're trying to change these into public spaces and, and also provide areas for travelers to, to be. Um, just disused, not disused on-ramps, but low traffic on-ramps. Um, I'm not sure exactly which ones they are, but turn them into public parks and, and create what in Germany is called the Wagenplatz, which is an area where um, people in you know traveling situations and RVs can come and they can park and they can live for indefinite periods of time. Is that the no and and yeah, in Miami we're working also on on zone on code free code free zones. But but there's still so much that we can do um, because it's not as arrogant to say that travelers you know have all this knowledge that they're bringing to Miami. I mean, effectively, all we know how to do really well is dig a hole and shit in it and pump vegetable oil illegally from a restaurant and turn it into fuel and just continue pushing ourselves around the country for, for whatever reason.
compels us to. But, but in terms of sustainability, this doesn't apply. But I wanted to show this because I think this is a poignant image. In addition to this image, which is um, where I wrote this talk today, <laughs> as I came into Miami <clears throat> to drop my um, wife and children off at their homeschooling class on Normandy, I took my truck and parked up at one of our old parking spots and, and sat down and, and wrote this talk in the back of a truck. Um, you know, we try. <laughs> We try to sort of get the word out there, and I'm, I'm glad. I was I was initially sort of initially apprehensive when uh, Amanda asked me to to do a talk here. She said, she said, "Come and do this talk," and I said, "Well, it's not going to be about art, you know." And she said, "No, it's all right. You can talk about these artists because they're kind of doing what you're doing." And I said, "I don't want to." <laughs> I said. I said, I don't really frame what I do in an artistic context anymore. I mean, we started off doing art and writing about art. And part of, part of the, the leisure and the high quality of life that I was talking about before gave, um, gave us, in a certain sense, and I know Sam especially, the, the leisure to, to engage in creativity without the need of a support structure, which is always very refreshing. Um, you know, not producing objects, just producing um, social statements or movies or whatever. But I don't know. Do you have Do you have something? I'm sort of failing. No, oh, we should just open it up to questions because you've kind of rattled on. I rattled on, yeah. didn't I? <laughs> but. <laughs> <thanks. clears throat> um, so like I said, like, I, I'm, I'm totally into turning this into an info mining, information mining session, if only for me to find a new parking spot in Miami so I can continue to work. Um, and I would love to talk about how this relates to art, but I don't really know how. And, and, and as I said, I was apprehensive about this because I didn't want to waste people's time. I didn't want to bring people here expecting to get an art lecture or a theoretical lecture and to not have one. Um, but the project is experiential and, you know, I try. I try to define the sustainability movement as I have researched it, but I don't really think it applies in, in the vernacular to us. No, it's been more of like an experiment, sort of a life, lifestyle experiment more than anything, I think. So I think that in itself could be, you know, art, but, and that's what it was originally. So, I mean, I wouldn't even classify this as sustainable as just like... Yeah, just a complete like shift in in lifestyle and perspective. I mean, we had to to really shift any every from from like literally like you know not having any job and figuring out how to sort of live without the money aspect and figure that out. And we had many sort of personal life breakdowns. I mean, I did. I had a lot of them all the time. <laughs> but um, you know, and then raising kids on top of it. And there's like a, a lot of pressure, and so we really had to sort of reconfigure our sort of, I don't know, social presence in society, I guess, and um, so, so yeah, here we are. Does anyone have any questions? questions? Yeah, questions. No questions. Well, um, I had more of a statement, I mean, you say you're not producing any objects for art per se, but, I mean, absent objects has always been my personal opinion that uh, art pretty much encompasses an idea rather than an object itself and as far as Amanda inviting you here is the idea of what you're doing it's more of an artistic uh, initiative than anything else not really necessary to have an object to discuss although I suppose the bus would constitute as an, as an object but even still outside of that it's the idea that it it represents mm -hmm. what you're trying to do as a project. Yeah, we feel we feel pressure less. Um, like we don't have to produce anything for sale, and we also like cannot produce any objects. Like that is something that just doesn't function in the way that we live at all. Like we're really limited in our space. Um, so I mean, Tom hasn't really been making art per se, but like I've gone on to starting to make performances. So there was a lot of like improv kind of like weird moments in. In our travels. Yeah, but what I find more interesting is the idea oh, for sure. of what you're doing, rather than the, any kind of 
you know, object that's being produced is the idea of what you're doing is a lot more fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. It's not really necessary to have any kind of object in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I drifted. I drifted from art. And I drifted so, I drifted well, so far from like it that I stopped even thinking it, about it. But you're still it. moving toward it in the sense of the idea of it. It seems to be more of what it's really um, about, you know, as far as what it overall encompasses, you know, because it's not, it's not about a producing object. I mean, maybe you're drifting from the idea of what art is conventionally perceived as, which is object making, and, and towards uh, the idea of what the object encompasses, which is the, the idea itself, the concept of what you are producing. I mean, if I could sell my bus as an art object, that would certainly solve well, a few problems. Well, I suppose th that could happen anyway. I mean, we are living in, an, I mean, I like to think we live in an optimistic world that a bus can be sold as a commodity. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the idea needs to be, you know, reached a lot more people and inspire a lot more people. And you are working on that with the project itself. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like a dream. We ultimately need to figure out how to uh, sustain, generate sort of a, a code file, code variance of where you go. You have to try to deal with municipalities or like code enforcement, so you have to create this sort of alternative living thing that's permitted. You, know, you have to create, somehow you've got to go to citizens to convince them that like we're not just an AKA living in campsite in an RV kind of place. We actually can live next to houses. We can live Sustainably without. It's like it breaks the code. It's also just like people's perspective of what. So you're battling. You're, you're battling a lot of people's baggage about what, like you say, gypsies. Oh, it's really. baggage. Yeah, our own baggage. Yeah. Gypsies, because gypsies are very good at living. Well, right. people would drive by us and shout, "Jerry Garcia!" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, well, I told you about yeah. that before. You guys even went on the road. I guess. Like, running across America, you don't see. You know, like run into a lot of right wing people and just see people in the bus and then hit each other. So, it's, so but, but, it's, but it seems like when you get good at it, you get to the point where you actually can live good, well, live sustainably, live whatever, and not pollute anything. That's, the, like, that's like, why like, they like, don't like, let like anybody do it. A lot of Jerry Garcia people that ran around in most like buses right. or, or, or big school buses polluted. They didn't necessarily, they would change their oil and leave it on the side road. So it wasn't necessarily a sustainable way of living. Mm -hmm. But you're doing that, you're doing that now, so so people still have this old baggage about what hippies are about. Because hippies didn't necessarily There's that. live people that are, way. are also just really like on yeah, it. Like so, you talk so. to code enforcement, you're like, but we compost, and they're like, what is that? You know, but it seems like you have to start yeah. from somewhere else, yeah. you have to start from somewhere else. Like, especially if you're, like, mm -hmm. like when I used to live in New York back in the 80s, like, because you're kind of like essentially squatting. Or even though you're squatting yeah. on, on per, you know, permitted property, you're still kind of squatting in people's minds because you're not playing their roles or their games. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you're kind of squatting, you know, even though it's not on, uh, necessarily an abandoned property. Oh, so true. you have to start from like the, the foundation of like creating a new permit. Of, like, okay, we're good at what we do, we should be allowed to live alongside people. There should be code variances for we people were, that live on buses or that are good at it. We were on like the verge of trying to set up um, <coughs> like an accreditation center for sustainable practices in Miami, more for off-grid living. I, I think that's what um, I'm yeah, so we're curious about more of your accomplishments as far as in, as yeah. in this, well, this city itself. I mean, you can talk to... The city, like, they're working on new codes to try and allow, like, there's a lot of community gardens that are popping up, but even that in itself is not really, like, permitted within the code. Um, right. So the codes can on, change. Uh, yeah, the codes are sort of constantly changing, <coughs> so they're working on that, and they're aware that, like, we're in town, there's another bus project in town, they're aware that we exist, and they're trying to accommodate it, I think, but... Yeah, but trying to get like the so office. Kind of find the loopholes. I mean, the office of sustainable initiatives for the city was started by Diaz, and um, when he left office, they cut all funding to it. It was okay. a it was a re it was a retrofitted building um, out on Seventh and Third Street, Northwest Seventh Avenue and Third Street. It's an old fire station, mm -hmm. um, and they got the water tanks. They've got the permeable concrete to to stop like runoff, so that the, so that aquifers can exist. And if they did that on a large scale, it would be great. But irrelevant on the scale that they're doing it. Um, and a building which was um, originally designed to house um, 25 separate. Uh, uh, people working has now been partitioned out and 75% of it has been rented out to other businesses 
and the Office of Sustainable Initiatives, which was 25 people, is now two and one intern. And I mean, the, we, our experience of them is that they haven't, they don't really do anything. Um, they, they do like CFL bulb giveaways, and they invite people like us to come and talk if we want to, because they have this great lecture space, theatre, it's all like renewable energy power, so, but nobody's there. Yeah. They've got bike racks that are always empty, and nobody, <laughs> nobody bikes to work. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of the problems that we had was with permitting as well, like, we are not um, rich. We're somewhat wealthy in the, in the respect that we have this huge um, recreational vehicle, which for many other people would be a luxury. And I was always astounded that people would see us and think, eh, gypsies. Because, I mean, the assumption should be, wow, these guys surely have no, a house somewhere. Not in, not in this country. Right. Um, but there is one, there's one permit that you can get in Miami that will enable you to do what we want to do, and it's called the Temporary Use of Vacant Land Agreement. So it's a, it's a zoning variance that you can get. And, and it's been around for about five years, and only one person has been able to get it. And that's the guy that runs the soccer locker on Northeast 2nd. It's basically a double vacant lot. He astroturfed it, put up a fence, and just rents it out to people who want to play sports. Um, the point you raised in terms of everybody doing what we were doing, we do it fairly well now because we have like instruments that let us know if we're making a disaster, um, cholera epidemics or E. coli epidemics or anything. But but if if everybody did what we were doing, like we did it when we started, we'd all be dead for sure. I mean, there's there's there, we we would have caused so many tr problems and environmental disasters, there'd be like composting toilets everywhere, waste vegetable oil flowing, I mean it'd be, it'd be horrible. <laughs> and, and, we would, and we were very careful not to sort of go into the public uh, as a project before we'd sort of mastered these to a certain degree. I mean with the waste vegetable oil system we're constantly refining it but um, I mean and I would say I am as fairly as good as Bob now with mechanics and stuff but um, but no it's dangerous and and it's and that's why they don't want you to do it because it, it's not safe you kind of on that you kind of represent this, this pirate urbanism in a way that I find is really amazing I mean it doesn't surprise me that you're coming across so much resistance because it's totally against the agency what typical urbanism now in this country is. Um, so you're in a way um, at the forefront of, of you know, even though you've been so much in the you're trying to do this in a very organized way, actually, um, very specific in the way that you're doing this, and, and the kind of mechanization of these systems of sustainability that you're, that you're advocating and you're making. And at the same time, this it goes against the grain of the agency of, of the city, you know, permitting and so forth, you're kind of a pirate kind of type of organism. So um, it's kind of a very interesting thing. You know, I applaud you for it. It's, it's a shame that it's rare. I mean, and it's not rare throughout, you know, the, a lot of other progressive cities in the country. I and mean, these, these things, right. Well, there's also, there's also a lot of cities that, that want to encourage, like, like back, I'll, I'll go back to the, side in the 80s was the city encouraged squatting because they wanted to bring back people to certain communities that had a lot of abandoned buildings. So they, so they kind of like ignored a lot of codes because they wanted people to be there. You know? So it was kind of a way of, it was kind of a way of gentrification you know, in the sense that they allowed squatting to help, to help bring back certain neighborhoods. So, so I think in that, in that, in that spirit, you can, you know, there's a lot of places that I know of that you could go live on a bus. I say there's a lot of places in Washington State, like, like Philadelphia, like Detroit, where there are places there where I'm sure that a lot of what you're doing would be high, more tolerated because mm -hmm. they want people there anyway. And they want to have sort of a community coming back. And a lot of times squatting 
Right. It does bring back, brings back. Community. I guess we've just not been because very good at picking the right areas. It's not even squatting what? because we go to these places and like we've been ex like you know it's privately owned and people will say yes yeah. you can come here you have the approval. But you're still squatting on codes. I, mean, I, I use that yeah. I use that term just like kind of like loosely because right. it's, it's, even though it's private property it's not city owned property. Like New York right. City was it was like a city owned property so squatting is it's really squatting on city property but they're still squatting codes. That exists. You know, so right. I guess you can kind of look at it that way. It's like you're squatting against people's perceptions of how you should live. So people want you to live the way they live. Mm -hmm. right. They want to prove it. And it's the complaints. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They. It's oftentimes not just the fact that a code enforcement officer drove by. Who's it's the people. People have complained. Mm -hmm. And I just. I mean, this most this last recent time, we were really happy where we were. And, we felt, you know, we'd left this community project in, in Wynwood and we moved north and a little bit of stability was kind of a refreshing change. We parked the bus up, we thought we'd be there for a while. And we were really saddened to, to be moved on. And, I mean, people don't realize that when they do that to secure their property values or to just be a stickler for the rules, you know, that they're really putting a family out. And we've had people um, call child services on us before. And we've had to take the child service um, counselor or whoever into the bus and show him that we have this area for the children and that we have a full fridge and that we homeschool. And, you know, they've gone away very satisfied, but it could have torn us apart. And we could have lost our kids just because we decided that we wanted to live on a bus and travel for a bit. You know? But, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, to live in a, in a house or an apartment right now unless I built it myself, because I don't want the temptation of being lazy. I don't want to think, oh, I'll just flush this toilet, you know, drinking water down the pan, I'm, I don't turn this light on, leave this light off. Now I have a finite amount of energy that I use, and I know every electrical connection, every plumbing fitting in my bus, and I know how much I am using. I can use that as a tool to go to people and say, look, can we live on your property? We're, we're going to produce X so amount of waste. It's not just about that, it's also just being aware of what we are putting out versus what we're sort of consuming, which I think on an individual level we probably are not very aware of, and I think maybe you're becoming more aware of, like with this like, sustainable movement, I guess. But um, it was just, the, the whole idea was just a rehaul in our perspective and, and lifestyle, and that was the original intent and still the intent to this day. And I think since we've gone through it and sort of come to the other side where we're sort of feeling the need to have a little more stability, it has completely like revamped our entire, like I feel like we've sort of like pressed the reset button. And um, I don't know, it, took, it took a lot of guts and a lot of really, really rough times to sort of come to where we are now, but I don't think that we would ever go back to the way that we lived previously, never ever. Yeah, um, which, you know, basically is like, living in a house, like having a secure job with like a steady amount of income, having two cars and feeling secure and like that no longer provides the security that we're used to because we know what we know now through our experience. So. You know what, I mean, what would you say are some of those things you feel like you know now but then make this that, that not appealing? <clears throat> a sense of security financially, which uh, I, I don't find appealing anymore. Um, I find more security in my uh, resourcefulness than I do um, financial. Um, security in knowing that, um, I guess I guess that's maybe it in general, just being resourceful, not only through finding money when we need to, finding food when we don't have money, um, homeschooling our children and feeling confident in, in that process. Um, you know, knowing that we could, like, literally, Tom, like, did not know how to, like, screw, like, two pieces of meat together when we started, so, like, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's also being confident that, like, you're going to be able to find the means to fix the things as they break, mm -hmm. which, beforehand, like, hands down, we were just like, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> like, you so, for no, so now there's a real security <laughs> in, <laughs> in knowing that, <laughs> well, I don't know, now there's we didn't need those skills, right? Right. 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 Or it was yeah. always like, well, I'm going to find that skill through someone else. And now it's right. all about sort of just like honing in, yeah. figuring it out, and spending the time needed, and giving ourselves the space to learn the things that we need in order to survive. Whereas I think the majority of us don't have that opportunity because it's so sort of 
sort of in this process of, of like, you know, going to the job to make the money in order to live, we are sort of trying to live our lives to live. Like, we're not trying to make the money to support the life, but rather just directly trying to eliminate that whole, mm -hmm. you know, aspect of here, just go directly to the living. So I'd much rather sort of, you know, like Tom was saying, I'd much rather, like, you know, figure out our composting toilet and dump that out and check the temperature and figure that, you know, make sure that's all working then to, you know, pay to have the toilet, you know, like set up. You know, I don't know, it's just more or less sort of direct and streamlined. But that, that plays into the economic side of sustainability, bringing in the ideas of like gift economy. I mean, we're thinking about setting up a this, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Sure, there's this, there's this uh, network called Time Banking. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Absolutely. it. Yeah. So I've been giving a lot of consideration to starting it, and I think a lot of people... Would you, would you just do everyone a favor and explain it? So Time Banking is a, is a network um, of time economy, I guess. And so essentially the way it works is that if I spend an hour um, giving my service to, services to you, then you would spend an hour giving your services to someone else who needs it. And so rather than using um, you know, physical money, you would use time as, as the economy and as the, as the trade. So, but there's no sort of value. The value is just strictly on the time. So you know, if I gave you a car surgery for an hour, that would be the same as you babysit and my kid for an hour. So. And it's, more, <laughs> it's more, I think, like also the shops are hurting. So you use like a different currency. Mm -hmm. And so you, there's a, you get like the credit also, and then you have like 10 hours, and you go to like a right. store and you like buy lunch for like half an hour. Exactly. So, for example, I mean, just I had an experience with this. Like, I actually um, I ended up working on a test, I ended up working on a project, um, which um, Anton Padova, who's a part of the, the root of the project, um, he uh, it kind of morphed from time, um, time banking and also into this project called Time Food, mm -hmm. which is where they would go and like through the banking system and their banks set up all over. Place to, uh, through that system, you could figure out uh, how many, you know, uh, you could, you could okay. bank it into food in these particular restaurants. And it was it was a project that was part of a mm -hmm. temporary exhibition called Lilius Forum um, that Creative Time produced uh, last year. But um, but essentially, it was that idea of like being able to transmogrify the thing into another um, into another uh, commodity. Mm -hmm. And there's another project called Power Goods, which I just had the privilege of working with as well. It's a similar uh, situation. Hour? Like or living wage. Well, it sounds like the idea of a living wage, like every hour people. Mm -hmm. I was just clarifying hour or the hour time of hour. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Have you found any, any part of the country here that's more receptive toward your approach? We haven't been to it all. We, we weren't, yeah, we weren't able to head out to the west coast. We sort of got stuck on the east coast, which was like never our intent. Um, the furthest west we got was like Texas. Texas. The furthest yeah. north we was were, South Dakota. Yeah, the plan was to sort of go to Marfa and then start heading into California. And then up yeah, I would to think like California or you know, Oregon, Oregon would be yeah. more receptive to maybe some kind of idea of, because I'd be hard pressed to find that no one on that side of the country isn't practicing this kind of approach oh, as well. Um, and you're on the road, like, what are we called? They're called, like, uh, rubber punks. <laughs> like, you know, um, tramps. Tram yeah, rubber tramps. Huh. So, um, yeah, there's all of that. And, and the rest stops are sort of, like, the place, you know, where you can sort of be like, you're, like, checking out other people's, like, you know, traveling situations. Yeah, and, like, to, and that, like, to that point, um, of course, like, this is an, out, like, an alternative lifestyle in many ways, but in addition, you're also sort of joining this plan of the folks that are, and, and in some ways, like, the, the laws of that plan are sort of well-defined, and there's... There's a huge, like, a, like so blogging community. Do you find that things. that actually, I mean, do you find that you're interested in being part and subscribing to those rules, or is that, was that never part of the interest? I or found do you find that, that, I find that, I I love that everyone's rules seem to be a little bit different okay. where we went, and so we ended up kind of, like, convenience style, like, morphing into sort of whatever situation we were in. It was like, we were in New Orleans, dumps and diving with some people that we just met, we're like, that was their thing, we're like, all right, let's do it, and we got the things, we're cutting it, and sure. we're like, Ugh. and then right. the next place was like, you know, I don't know, like, being really, um, I'm trying to think of a good comparison to that, um, <laughs> being at our, we were traveling with another bus family for a while, being at their parents' house, where, like, we had to be really kind of, like, 
clean and cut and sort of like, you know, just trying to sort of morph into that situation and ended up just kind of getting kicked out because our kids were wild. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was just like we were, and I, and I still feel this way, like we're, you know, everywhere we go, it's always sort of, um, we're always surveying the situation, the people, are, their, their expectations of us are, you know, and just the boundaries, yeah. it's just a constant, constant sort of evaluation. struggle, with it, but evaluation, yeah, where yeah. I don't know, we're never on our terms, yeah. it's always on someone else's, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, we came across many intentional communities. Sometimes, like intentional communities of one mm -hmm. people who just have land and set themselves up and say, like, this is it. Intentional, and, um, intentional community that's a that's like a what does it mean? It, people who have come together for a, for a specific uh, philosophical cause, either to be vegan or you know to live um, without fanaticism or you know. Yeah, it's you know, it's kind of like a community. There's, there's resource websites you can Google intentional communities and find like wherever you, wherever you want to go. You can just do like a you could probably do like a timeshare thing with them and spend your life traveling. Um, one more question and then um, <laughs> I'll get off the art track. But I, know, I don't want it to be misconstrued because I understand that this a lot of the struggles um, that have come as part of the project are not deliberately as for art sake, and I, and I absolutely understand that. But it's just a question I wanted to ask is that um, thinking about artists like, just for example, like Daddy Christopher and John God, Brown, uh, and something uh, like that, where they will go and through the, a, the um, machine. they will go through this entire yeah, two-year process, for example, like one. to wrap the Reichstag. Right. Like they go yeah. through yeah. all the red tape with multiple governments um, to wrap this building, this important government building, with all this history. And, of course, like, process of bureaucracy and exposing all of these difficulties or, or, or bad things that come out of this bureaucratic process and these, this is part of the point of their practice. Do you ever feel or did you ever get interested or think or consider um, you know, the, the process by which you go through and say, for example, this, this, uh, the, the, the police who ever stopped you and said, well, we don't know what composting is. I mean, just like, just having those moments of exposing these things or breaking through these things or exposing an educational. why the schools are the way they are. I mean, I guess I'm just for, trying for to, sure. to, that, to I mean, figure out what that's of interest. That's, that's what I just said. I think that's where, the, where we originally took sort of the baton and, and, and decided to redirect the project in that way where it was like sort of a, uh, an experiment on the life and a question about like our lifestyle and, and that question with the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it can be seen as, as art in the sense that we, you know, document it mm -hmm. and display it mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and you expose it. I mean, you do expose. For sure, for sure. Um, I think that we go through ups and downs. I think there's periods where we're like fighting the fight kind of thing, and we're really like exposing it, and we're really into it, and we're really. Um, I mean, do you ever consider yourselves as activists, or is that you're just like, no, we just need a place to park for us? I do. You don't you would you consider yourself as educational, like in practice, as far as informing the public on what you do exactly? We've done like little expos at schools and things. Well, it's not so much at schools, but just in general, like anybody who's curious or maybe even hostile to what you're doing. Like I said, I mean, I consider the project as a resource for right. anyone, like directed marketing towards people who are interested in this sort of thing. Right. And. Uh, and I suppose I should hope that anyone who has no knowledge of sustainability or the sustainability movement, should they come across <coughs> the website, would uh, know more about it and perhaps feel more empathy with it um, when they close their computer. For them. Because it's more, more of these people are going to be more coming at you in a hostile um, approach rather than, you know, and that's when I would say it's better to be more educational as far as response to hostility as to having them evolve it from hostility to a curiosity. Right. As to what no, I prefer doing. to think of what we do as a demonstration than, than like a, than an education. Um, but people are more hostile toward demonstration, especially in this country, mm -hmm. you know, so I would say, but they're more receptive to uh, education, at least more to curiosity, because a lot of people in this country are very curious about something that's different rather than something that is more I mean, maybe I'm being presumptuous in saying that you, too, have more experience in the matter than I would. I'd say people are less curious and more rejected more than they are curious, for sure. 
Is there any way they would be more curious about what you're doing as far as an approach as you could take in order to do that? Um, I think every city is different. Like, you know, like we went into New Orleans and it was like everyone's like knocking at a door like, hey, come park over here. Like, you know, everyone's like really receptive. Mm -hmm. And then upstate New York, everyone was like, well, I would think that New Orleans would be more receptive because you offer innovative ideas on how to... It's, it's also a very transitional or like right. transient sort of town, and there's a lot of that going on. There's, there's carnival embedded in the culture there. Yeah, so right. Exactly. Well, well, we also... It's Mardi Gras today, yeah, isn't it? Yes. Did you? Oh, you did? Oh, okay. And I was thinking <laughs> that... What's it called? It was... Was it Transit Antenna Residence? Residence. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Olivia was our first um, resident, and the idea behind it had a couch available and we wanted to take people on the road with us and experience um, the road, you know, in a tight space with the kids, with the whole thing, um, experience that communal living, take an experience and either on location or take it back to their um, um, So I don't know, how did you feel about that, Olivia? <laughs> I'm actually showing that one next Tuesday after the Okay. So we're showing it at Cannonball after we're doing a bunch of pictures on the side on Thursday, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. Yeah. And so we're going to be showing that in our project. Yeah, it's awesome. So, so I mean, I, I think, I don't know how, I think for Tom it's less art for me, it is much more art oriented. I spend my entire time in the guts Tom's, of the bus. Tom's though. like, yeah, always. Right, but I mean, just, but the experience that I had was taking this smaller system and rescaling it into a city. So, like, when our cities double in population, double in density, these are the only systems I feel that could actually make things um, sustainable. Sustainable. Like, we're not going to turn into Mumbai if we use these systems. Mm -hmm. There will be such a disparity in, 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 in uh, access to these. Scaling it, and I think whether you want to or not, it could be a good strong force in the way we rebuild our cities. Um, so you should like continue to try to get into the core as you're being pushed. Like, that could be a project, you know. So. <laughs> well, there's, there's also this, you know, the notion of like. But also, if you look at you know the, the, the system we basically live in, which is capitalism, which is basically hinged on growth. And so when you when you promote things that are sort of like anti-growth or degrowth or ungrowth or whatever, how you rewilding. It, yeah, the, the, uh, the, it can be progressive, but maybe. Yeah, no, but I think I think that's the, sometimes a lot of people have a problem with that because they, because there's a pro growth it, capitalism is not sustainable in itself. Just by nature, it has to always use up raw materials. It has to always use up everything of natural resources. It has to use up whatever human labor is always renewable, but, but, but natural resources aren't. So a lot of pro-growth capitalistic tendencies basically lead to unsustainable societies that, that you talked about earlier about how, how societies collapse because they overuse their... So like, so like in a sense, what, 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 I think what a lot of people sort of have this knee-jerk reaction to is like people that are sponsoring like degrowth Ungrowth, like just like going going the opposite, like unemployment, like high unemployment, could actually be a good thing for society. You know, because it just that means there's there's less factories mass producing pointless commodification or whatever this or that. So, so I think I think, so I think that the, the subtext of a lot of what you're doing has a lot to do with people like hitting that kind of uh, or understanding this kind of like, when you're not supporting growth. You know, not really supporting, like living in a house, living, living in a world where you, no. you're, where you're making more babies. I'm totally undecided. You know, so it's a, when I saw I wouldn't be surprised. But not overpopulating the world, you know, so you're living it to, to two. Right. Okay, it's you know, one that's in that's China, that's whatever. That's you know what I'm saying? saying? It's like there's a certain kind of like sustainability that comes with not growing, yeah, not non growth. Yeah, well, not necessarily. It doesn't have to be. Because, because humans, human society has the ability to not be part of nature. Humans have the ability to understand nature and to like realize that we are overproducing, over, or but digging I, up I, too much ore I, from the earth. Or I think that sort of that perspective of being an isolated yeah. 
center of consciousness inside a bag of skin it's, it's that is like not your environment, is that is not, that is your, not your environment, yeah. sets up a fundamental um, idea of hostility. That you know, like, oh shit, I'm basically on my own in, on this earth, and and it leads to a mistreating of the environment because yeah. you you see the environment as something which is not you. You know, you you say that you were. You well, were, you were they, born into this also, world, but you grew out of yeah, it. Yeah, the argument back at that is like, so like you, could, you could go to the Christian fundamentalist who look back and say, we can't destroy the environment because God's always going to take care of us. But that's you know, because so they... So God's is like the surrogate for nature. Right. You know, and, and Christian mentality. But do, you, can't, yeah, but, you can't just say that if we're all born in nature, it's all going to work out. You know, it's like, oh, it's, I think the difference there would be that the, the Christians fundamentally believe in a mechanical universe that was created, whereas, like, say, yes. Chi the Chinese believe in, in a natural universe that, that grew. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a Chinese kid saying, Mummy, how was I made? You know, they'd say, Mummy, how did I grow? Where did I come from? Western philosopher to, to speak in terms of, like, we are just part of world, like, or part of the environment, like animals. We are no different than anything else, but we play our part. But, but you know, modern industrialization proves that all, because we have the ability to transcend all of that. We have, we have the ability to transcend. But we don't know the far-reaching implications of what we're doing. When, uh, we do know, because it's called pollution. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> really profound experience that I had, um, and I think Cut chicken's head off with a button knife. I was going to say that his butter knife oh, just wasn't very sharp. Um, <laughs> but to, to talk about that experience, um, you know, I would say that overall the project has been kind of a death and like a rebirth, where there was sort of a death of our previous identity and death of a, a particular um, idea and perspective, like a complete, like, you know, crying death. Um, and then there's sort of a rebirth that happens after that. And, and the people that do, when you do it by choice, I mean, if I yeah. know, you have to acknowledge the fact that you kill the piece of something. Mm -hmm. You see a cow killing the spot that you took it from. The reality of like, the spirit of the movie and blood and everything else. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an abstraction. It's and it is it is choice because I could have always just gone and like found money somewhere and purchased it, but on the odd occasion that we killed out of necessity when we literally had nothing to eat, it didn't really cross my mind. It was just like get this done as quickly as possible and make damn sure it doesn't get away from me because I need this and my children need this. And this somewhere when you're back into potential capitalism. Returning to the structures that would lead to politics and economy, that's a problem. But I don't think that's, I don't think that's the same thing. Well, I mean, I, if you're looking for the art thing, the art thing that relates to this, I think a lot of it has to do with, do exactly with the growth and with, like, the simplicity of living or 
with that a lot of stuff. A lot of like a lot of modern thought has a lot to do with you know taking away the layers of things that you need, reducing things, reducing things to very minimal. So like in a, in a sense, like degrowth is kind of like a modernist idea, but it's not 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 modernism in the sense of like. 50s or right. mid-century modernism on four. It's more of like the new modernism is like living simply, living simply, which is kind of like degrowth. So it's kind of like it's like an ultra an ultra modern. It's like Boyard was talking about that. Just getting, just getting to this new sustainability. Like I don't know if with that. That's like uh, sure yeah, because that's I think that's a very, very important way to look at. It. Was it was it I think it was Victor Boyard as well as. Okay, we also wrote a lot of text about what is the new modernism. The new modernism is a very simplistic way of being sustainable. Sustainable. I mean, which which has a lot to do with art. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
close things up and shut things down. But thank you. To relieve your intern. No, yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> Thank you.